So actually, the story continues after the triumphal entry. Today, we're going to continue the story. Jesus is brought to Jerusalem, and he's interrogated by the authorities. And Pontius Pilate says, I don't even see anything wrong with this guy. He hasn't committed any crimes. But because the Jewish religious leaders were feeling threatened by Jesus, they started saying, well, you know, they tr started trumping up charges. They're like, well, this guy, just crucify him anyways. And they started uh, getting false accusations against Jesus. And so finally, the Romans are like, all right, we'll do it crucified Jesus. And after he died, they buried him in a tomb and they put this huge stone in front of the entrance. And then they posted Roman guards in front of that tomb just because there was this word going around that Jesus was going to rise again in a few days. And they're like, okay, well, we don't want his disciples to come steal his body. So we're going to put some guards in front and uh, put this huge stone, make sure that nobody, the body never disappears. So no one ever thinks that this guy is like a Messiah or anything like that, or, or God or anything like that. And, uh, and then, then the, um, like the unthinkable happened and Jesus actually rose from the dead. And, uh, and, and then he appeared to hundreds of people in a period of about 40 days. So there are a thousand different directions you can go with the Easter message. There are a thousand different directions you can go with the resurrection story. I thought about preaching on why I believe in the resurrection. I also thought about uh, how the resurrection is good news and how it changes our lives. Thought about going that direction. And of course, there's always when all hope is lost and it's Friday, Sunday's on, on the way, right? Like there's, there's, there's several different directions you can go with the Easter story, but I was, I was thinking about it this week, early this week, I was praying, I was like, Lord, which direction do you want me to go for Sunday? And for a couple of days, I just wrestled over it. And finally, I felt like the Lord said, look at the life of Peter. And so I did, and that is our message today, from cowardice to courage. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to uh, John chapter 21. If you don't have your Bibles, that's totally fine. We have the text up here. We also have it in your notes. We also have it on our church app. When the Lord steered me towards Peter, it made sense because this really applies to a lot of us where we're at. As you'll see in your notes, Peter was one of the apostles that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. And so Peter believed in the resurrection, okay? And then Jesus breathed on his disciples and, and they were filled with the spirit of God. So he was saved. He had a, a rebirth experience. He was reborn. So he believed in the resurrection. He was reborn. And then if you jump to the end of your notes, you see that, that Peter lived a radical life for Christ and followed him to the death. So believed in the resurrection. He was born again, did amazing things for Jesus. But there was this interim season where he was actually struggling, where Peter was actually in a funk. He was slipping back to his old habits. He was racked with guilt and his life just wasn't very victorious for God. And I get the feeling, I feel like the reason why God directed me towards Peter is, is because I feel like there's a lot of people that can relate to that. A lot of us are camping out where Peter was camping out. We believe in Jesus, we believe in the resurrection, we've been born of God, but like Peter, we're just in a funk. Sometimes we just struggle. Let me explain, explain how Peter got there. Peter was one of Jesus' core followers. And, and one day Jesus prophesied, he said, by the way, there's coming a day where they're going to crucify me and you guys are all going to desert, desert me. And Peter's like, not a chance. He says, I'm your super disciple. He said, there's no way, even if everybody else leaves you, Jesus, I love you the most, so I'm going to follow you to the death. Nobody will, nobody will follow you like I do. I'm your number one, Jesus. And then Peter, Jesus tells him, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, not a chance. And then Jesus gets arrested, and it looks like he's going to be crucified. And all of his followers start to kind of disappear one by one. They're like, I'm out of here. I don't want that to happen to me. Right? And then Peter's trying to see what's going on as the authorities are interrogating Jesus. And so he finds himself in Caiaphas's courtyard. Caiaphas was the high priest, and he finds himself in his courtyard, warming himself over a charcoal fire. Make note of that, okay? And he's watching Jesus through the window as they're interrogating him. And other people are warming themselves by the fire as well. And one of them says, hey, you're one of Jesus' followers, aren't you? You kind of talk like a Galilean. And, and Peter gets all defensive. He's like, no, 
I never heard of him. You talk like a Galilean, right? Like it, it's just all defensive. And so, he, you know, they zigged and so he zagged, right? Um, that's what he does. And, and then this middle school girl is like, he's like, hey, I, I think I saw you following him. Were you following that guy that's being interrogated in there? And he's like, yeah. And he starts pointing out to the other people like, it's just, just a middle school girl. Like who's going to listen to her? You know, she you know, can't, can't trust a middle school girl. And all of a sudden, the, everyone around the fire starts looking suspiciously at this Peter guy. And some of them are actually relatives of the guy whose ear Peter cut off. And so they start whispering to each other and like, like pointing with their eyes like, that, that guy, isn't he the one? Yeah, I think he's the one. Finally, one of them says, we know that you were with this Jesus and Peter's like, I don't know the guy. Get off my back. And as soon as he says that, a rooster crows. And immediately Peter was reminded of what Jesus said, that he would deny him three times before the rooster crowed. So he storms off and he's cursing like a drunken sailor. And he's broken and he's weeping. And from that moment on, Peter felt like a failure. Over the next few days, Jesus would rise and he would breathe his Holy Spirit into Peter. And all that happened in Jerusalem. All of it was super important. But there's a tiny detail in, in Matthew chapter 28 that, that a lot of times we overlook. And that is that Jesus sent word to the disciples. He's like, hey, after this Passover feast, I want you guys to meet me at a mountain in Galilee. So after the feast, they start going up to Galilee, meet him at the mountain. And we don't know if the disciples went to the mountain or not. Texting wasn't very advanced back then. And they didn't have find my friend or... GPS tracking or anything like that. So, so like you can imagine the disciples are like, well, we're his inner core, right? And he told us to go meet him at the mountain. So he's going to be there in a couple days. Let's get there in a couple days. So they get there in a couple days. Two days pass, three days pass, four days pass. Jesus still isn't there. After three weeks, they still haven't heard from Jesus. And so they're like, well, now what do we do? We thought we were his favorites. Maybe not. What do we do now? They're struggling like, with it. Like what happens to a lot of us, even though we're saved and we believe in the resurrection, our failures throw us into a funk sometimes. What do we do when that happens? Well, let's see what Jesus did when, to get Peter out of his funk. Because Peter went on to do some amazing things for the Lord, but Jesus had to get him out of, out of his funk first. After three weeks of waiting for Jesus with no luck, finally Peter said, and we read it here in John chapter 21, Peter said, I'm going fishing. And the disciples say, we'll come too. So they went out in the boat and they caught nothing all night. Jesus had called them to be fishers of men. Jesus had called them to be all about the business of bringing people into the family of God. He called them into the ministry but when their failures kicked in, when Jesus didn't do the things that they expected him to do, they didn't do, he didn't do things according to their plan. And they weren't sure really if they could really live the Christian code and be worthy of their calling. That's when the lure to their old lives got really strong. You know the feeling? Peter finally said, I'm going fishing. And there was no mistaking what Peter was saying here. He's saying, I'm going back to my old life. I'm going fishing. You see, all of us have a tent. All of us have a tent that represents our old life. It's got all of our memories in it. It's got all of our old habits, all of our old feelings, all of our old relationships. All of our exes are in that tent all of our successes and failures. It's a tent that represents a time in our lives when we lived for ourselves. We did whatever we wanted. The tent is all about us. It's all about me. And Peter started camping out in this old life tent. And you can just imagine Peter took a deep breath and he's like, ah. And exhaling with failure, he said, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to my old life. I don't know if I can follow Jesus the way he wants me to. You guys know the lure, don't you? You ever been there? 
You're just like, ah, just, I don't know if I can do it. The lure to the old life gets strong sometimes. The Bible says that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And the, when it says the flesh, it's not talking about skin. It's not talking about our bodies. What is it talking about? It's talking about that part of us that just wants everything to be all about us, where everything is about me. That's the flesh. And that wars with our spirits. When the doubts kick in and the failures rack up, and when Jesus doesn't respond the way we think he should, that's when the lure to the old life just kind of becomes really strong. We start unzipping the entrance. We're like, man, I don't know. There's something really familiar about this. I don't know. Maybe, I know I, know I shouldn't, but I think, I think I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to peek in the old tent. I don't know. I, I, I know I shouldn't. I know I walked away from that for a reason because it didn't satisfy, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe I can just peek in there and I just unzip it a little, little bit more. I mean, I've got so many years of habits built up in that old tent. I don't know. What's, what's the harm? I don't know, maybe, I don't know, there, there was such a, a rush of dopamine in my brain every time I lived for myself and kind of did whatever I wanted. I don't know, there was something thrilling about that. I did whatever I wanted, I don't know, it's just kind of nice to just do whatever I wanted. I, I, think I'm, I think I'm just gonna climb back in that tent. And as soon as we crawl in that tent and we start camping in it, we put a pause on all the amazing things that God wants to do through us. Peter said, I'm going fishing because he didn't think he could ever get past the fact that, G that he had denied Jesus three times. And every time a rooster crowed, he would just shiver with PTSD, right? Like, oh, I did it. That was me. Failed Jesus. And that's the problem with our old life tent. In that tent, our past failures define us. Our culture tells us we are the sum of all the things we do. I did this, I feel this, therefore this must be who I am. And when you reject my behavior, you're rejecting me. When you reject what I feel and my feelings, you're rejecting me. Because what I do is who I am. What I feel is who I am. You see, all of us have this God-sized hole in our hearts, right? This God-shaped vacuum, as Blaise Pascal said. We all have this hole in our hearts that can only be filled with the Spirit of God. But because we have these holes, it, 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 it begs the question, who am I? We all walk around wondering, who am I? And if you aren't filled with the Spirit of God, you fill out with a whole bunch of other stuff and you, you, you start thinking that we are what we feel or we are, my identity is the things that I do. Whether you're a, the fancy word is libertinist, whether you're someone who casts off the rules and you're like, okay, I don't want the rules, I'm just gonna do whatever my flesh wants and you have to accept me for that. That's filling that God-sized hole, that God-shaped hole in our hearts with our behaviors, right? And the other extreme is the legalist. That's the, the rule abider. That's the rule follower. That's just like, I'm going to fill that hole in my heart with a whole bunch of good deeds. If I just do a whole bunch of good stuff, then I will be a good person. This is where false religions get it wrong. Christians completely, Christianity is completely different than that because Christianity says, no, you're not a good person because you did good stuff. You're, good, you're filled with the goodness of Jesus. That's the only leg you have to stand on for your righteousness. Righteousness is a gift. Goodness is a gift. We'll talk about that more in the days ahead. The point is that Peter failed, and so he thought he was a failure. Instead of saying, I failed, but the failure doesn't define me. 
Verse 4, at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but his disciples couldn't see who he was. Why? Because at the crucifixion, they took his robe and they raffled it off, and they're like, all right, okay, you get to keep it. And so now Jesus is standing on the side of the beach with a jeans and a t-shirt, and they're like, what? Who is that? We don't recognize him. And so, uh, so he called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. And they're like, come on, we're the fishermen here. We're, we're professional fishermen, like, Our answer is six feet away. Are you serious? Like we've been doing this all night. But they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. And you might be thinking, haven't haven't I heard this story before? Absolutely. This is what Jesus did when he called these fishermen into the ministry. And he called them to come become fishers of men and to be all about bringing people into the family of God. The exact same story. Verse 7, then the disciple Jesus loved, who is John. John says to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, and he jumped in the water and he headed to shore. That's kind of funny, isn't it? Like he puts on his clothes and then jumps in the water and heads towards shore. This is what I get from that. In the old life tent, our past successes define us just like our past failures define us, right? Right? It's all about us. In this tent, we are what we've done, whether it's good or bad. If I do a lot of good things, then I'm a good person. If I did one amazing thing once, then I'm an amazing person. How am I getting this from this text? All right, so this is fun. So John tells Peter, hey, this is Jesus. What does Peter do? He puts on his clothes, jumps in the water, and and, uh, why? Because he's camping out in a tent that's all about him. He's like, step aside, guys, I'm Peter. I'm the guy that walks on water. Check this out. (laughs) He puts his clothes on and he jumps in the water because he's totally expecting to walk to Jesus because after all, he's the super disciple, right? Probably a lot of other people thought he was a super disciple too. I mean, think about the street cred that you get when you've walked on the water. You can go to any restaurant and be like, hey, can I have a cup of water? Yeah, here's some water. Speaking speaking of water, (laughs) did... Did I ever tell you about the time that I, you know, walked on water? And they're like, what? That was you? We read about on the paper? That's crazy. I, I know. Well, I, I am a super disciple. I, I, am, I am pretty, I am Jesus' favorite. You know, like I, I, am, I am kind of the, the water walker. You know, I mean, that's me. <laughs> and he's ready to do it again because he's Peter, right? He's, he's the guy that walks on water. And he puts his clothes on and says, check this out. And he jumps out of the boat. And the next thing the disciples hear is, splash, glug, 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 glug. <laughs> They're like, he's like, oh, shoot, it didn't work this time, right? Instead, Jesus is like, yeah, we're, we're not doing that today, Peter. Um, if I call you to walk on the water, you can walk on the water. But unless I call you, have a nice swim, Okay. Jesus doesn't always answer our prayers in the ways that we expect him to. But if we're camping in a tent where we get all the glory for our past successes, then we're going to eventually start chalking that up to our amazingness. We're going to chalk that up to how righteous we are, how creative we are with our prayers, or how powerful we are and bold we are. Instead of just saying, it was only because of your grace that I was able to do anything that I did. All the praise to you, Jesus. It reminds me of a time when I was a kid. I told, the, I told this story a few months ago, but I didn't tell you part B of the story. The story is my sisters and I, and Trisha will verify this story. My, sis, my sisters and I were trapped in a room when we were in, I was in second grade, Trisha was in fourth grade, Esther was in fifth grade. And we're trapped and we're talking for a while and then all of a sudden we realized, oh no, we're trapped in the room, the door's broken, we can't get out. Mom and dad were planting a church, they weren't gonna be home for several hours. And so we're like, what do we do? And we're panicking, panicking, you know, and we're like, oh, you can't get any food, what are we gonna do? And so finally we get on our knees and, you know, calm down and we say, okay, let's just pray. And so we prayed and we said, Lord, can you help us get out of this room? And as soon as we were done with prayer, we said, amen, we heard this click and we looked up and the door had opened about six inches. There was nobody else in the house. 
It was just the hand of God taking care of three small kids. Just open. It was one of those miracles that we look back on our lives like God was so cool in that moment. Okay, I tell you, it's a cool story, right? Like I tell you that story to tell you this story. That like five or six years later, we're at dinner. We had a, a, a best, best friend. His name was uh, Jonathan Plummer. And our parents and his parents were all friends. Our families were friends. We're out at dinner, downtown Buenos Aires. That's where we're living at the time. And, and all of us, and, and we were like, mom and dad, you guys are going to talk all night. So can we go to John's house? And, and they're like, yeah, you'll have to catch a cab. And we're like, fine. So we hop in a cab. We go across town. We get to John's house. He lived on the penthouse suite of this high-rise building in Buenos Aires. And we get there. And as we're pulling up, he's like, oh, shoot, I forgot the key. And calm as you'll get out, I was like, John, it is all right, because you are with the right people. Like, we have an anointing <laughs> for opening closed doors. Like, you're going to be fine. Like, I was just sure. I was like, John, it's all right. He's like, Dave, you don't understand. It's bolted from the inside. I was like, John, quit with the doubt. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. Like, let's, let's just go up and pray, and, and we'll be all right. And so we go up to, this, to the foyer of his, his uh, Skyrise apartment, and, uh, and, and we, all four of us say a prayer. The door doesn't open. And so it's like, obviously, it's John's fault. So, you know, Esther, why don't you and John go downstairs, talk to the guards, see if you guys can, can figure something out with them. And uh, and, and so then Trish and I are up there in the foyer and we're like, oh, you know, let's, let's pray. I mean, we, we have, we're the ones with the real faith here. So, uh, so, <laughs> so, so we pray again, nothing happens. And they're like, well, it has to be our posture. Like we really want God to know that we're serious. So why don't we lay on the ground? So we lay on the ground, faces before God and God open this door. We believe that you can do it. You've done it in the past. You can do it again. Door doesn't open. Maybe there's too many distractions. So let's turn the lights off. So we turn the lights off, lay back down on the ground. Okay, God, Lord, we know you can open the door. We believe in you. Our faith was high. Door didn't open. But what did happen was while we were praying, the Lord tapped John's dad on the shoulder and John's dad was like, oh, kids don't have the key. I need to run it to them. So he hops in his car, drives across town, gives us the key. We go upstairs and we hang out for the next couple hours while he goes back and, and our parents just talk uh, for the next couple hours. So it was one of those moments where, where I realized that two exact same situations, we needed a door to open. Number two, we said prayer in all great faith, but three, God can really answer the prayers however he wants. He doesn't have to do it the way we want him to, right? And in this case, Peter's like, hey, Jesus, you're going to do it just like you did in the last time, right? I'm going to jump out in the water and I'll walk to you just like I did before. Because that was really cool. And Jesus is like, yeah, well, we're not doing that today. I'm going to do something a little bit different. I don't know if my sisters were thinking this in the moment, but I was totally resting on my past successes. Rather than saying, Jesus, you can do what you did in the past or you can do something different. Or you can do nothing at all. Either way, we're going to give you the glory. Verse 8, the others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. And so they're, they're paddling past Peter, and they're like, so you need a hand down there? <laughs> you, wanna, you know, they see him like dog paddling all the way to the shore. You, you want us to help you up? And like, no, I, I meant to do this. I, I meant to put my clothes on and start swimming. Yeah, right. <laughs> so... Camping out in the old life tent. This is the bottom line about tents. It just doesn't work. The disciples said, we're going fishing. We're going back to our old lives. And Jesus said, so how's that working for you guys? Hey, have you guys caught anything? No, but we've been working really hard all night at it. Jesus was showing them that the way that you're living your old life just isn't working. The old life tent has a lure sometimes, doesn't it? The old life tent, however, will never satisfy. We get nostalgic for that tent. It's a tent that we'd never want to live in, though. Like, we left it for a reason. We left it because it didn't satisfy. But here's Peter saying, I'm going fishing. And all the disciples are like, yeah us too. And Jesus is like, how's that working out for you? It's not. It doesn't satisfy when I've called you to something else. So what happened next? Peter was camping out in the old life tent, but Peter was being called 
to follow Jesus. And when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Remember I said to make note of the charcoal fire? There's fire all throughout the Bible, okay? There's only two places where it talks about a charcoal fire. The first is when Peter was denying Jesus over a charcoal fire as he's uh, in Caiaphas's courtyard. And the second time is here where Jesus sets out a charcoal fire because he's setting the stage for redemption. He's setting the stage for Peter's restitution or uh, uh, <laughs> rehabilitation. What's the word I'm looking for? The, where, yeah, restoration. He says, bring some of the fish you caught because your fish are big. Right, Jesus said, so Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to shore. And there were 153 large fish, and yet the net had not torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. And this was the third time Jesus had appeared to the disciples since he had been raised from the dead. Did you notice what happened here? Verse six, the disciples couldn't lift the net full of fish out of the water. And here in verse 10, Jesus is like, hey, bring some fish. And, <laughs> and Peter all by himself did something that all the other disciples combined couldn't do. What does he do? He goes and he gets the net, and he brings it ashore. Why? Because Jesus had called him to do it. If Jesus is like, hey, go get those 153 fish, you can do it. If Jesus tells us, hey, you can walk on water, we can walk on water. We aren't called to follow Jesus because we're equipped. We're equipped because we're called to follow Jesus. And when we're following Jesus, whatever he asks us to do, we can do it, okay? If the, world, if the word of God tells us we can overcome temptation, we can do it. If Jesus tells us we can heal the sick, we can do it. Jesus tells us we can witness to a coworker, we can do it. If the Bible tells us we can turn the world upside down, we can do it. But in Peter's case, Jesus knew that he would never be, he would never believe that he could accomplish the things that God called him to do unless he addressed the elephant in the room. Verse 15, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? In other words, do you love me more than these other disciples? Because you remember a few weeks ago, you said, even if they all fail you, I never will. All right, time to get down to brass tacks. He says, do you love me more than these other disciples? You said you were my super disciple. And he says, yes, Lord. Peter replied, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Okay, this is really interesting. In English, love is love. There's only wor one word for the word love. But in Greek, which is the new, what the New Testament was written in, there are four words for the word love. We don't understand what's going on here in the English, but let me just explain it real quick. There's four words. The highest one is agape love. The next one is phileo type love or uh, yeah, phileo love, which, which is like a brotherly, brotherly love, okay? So that's why Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love, okay? So you've got agape love, which is the highest, then phileo love, which is kind of like, hey, I really love you. I really like you like a brother. I love, I love you like a brother. Um, and so, but the highest love is agape love. That's the godly love. That's the unconditional type love. And here Jesus says, hey, Peter, do you agape me? It's the highest form of love. Do you love me unconditionally? And ah, Peter's like, oh, that's a painful question because I said I would love you to the ends of the earth. And... I just can't say it now. Yeah, I, I, I phileo you. That's what he says. I love you like a brother. I really, really like you. Jesus says, feed my lambs. Verse 16, Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me with an unconditional love? Do you agape me? He asked the question again, and oh, this is painful. Peter's like, Jesus, I... I I, I really want to say that I agape you, but I, I phileo you. That's all I can say. Because I said I agape you before, but I, I failed. And then the third time Jesus asks, he doesn't ask this, he asks this. He's like, Peter, do you really, really like me? Peter, do you love me like a brother? And Peter's like, I can say that. Yeah, I, I really do. I really love you like a brother. And then Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Jesus says to Peter and to us, wherever you are on the scale of one to 100, it doesn't have to be 100. It's okay. Wherever you're at on the scale, I'll take it and I'll work with it. 
Hey, you're like, ah, oh, God, I want to love you like 100, but I, I only got 80. He's like, I'll work with that. <laughs> it's fine. I love it. I love the 80, right? Ah, oh, I, I can only give you 50% love. It's fine. I'll work with that. It's okay. Wherever you're at, I'm meeting you there. Even you're a rebellion, <laughs> you've decided to go fishing. I'll meet you there. Maybe that's where you're at. You're, you know, you're camping out in the, camping out in the tent. You're camping out in the old life tent. Jesus, is like, I'll meet you there. It's all right. If you've only got a little bit of love, 10, 15%, I'll work with that too. Feed my lambs. Just keep the main thing the main thing. And in the best of your ability, just try to bring people into my family. In your old life tent, your mistakes define you. But when we're following Jesus, God brings up your past not to hurt you, but to heal you. Jesus wasn't trying to embarrass Peter in front of his friends. He wasn't saying, you thought you loved me, Peter? It sure didn't look like it three weeks ago, right? That's, that's not what he was saying. He's saying, Peter, I know about it. I saw it. I was there. I saw when you betrayed me, and I forgive you. And I'm not going to hold that against you. Don't walk in guilt or shame. And Jesus says the same to us this morning. Don't walk in guilt and shame. I saw it. I forgive it. Walk in freedom. You are who I say you are. And I say that you're loved. When we're following Jesus, this is the last point. God's love defines us. As the popular song says, you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. And you say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am held when I am falling short. And when I don't belong, you say I am yours. We only camp out in the old life tent because we forget who we are sometimes. And then Jesus finishes. He says, I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter lived a radical life for Christ and he followed him to the death. And the, the very next thing he did after this encounter, he goes and he preaches and 3,000 people come to Christ. And then Peter goes and he heals the sick. And then Peter goes and he, he, uh, he, he uh, casts out demons and he raises up disciples that raise up other disciples. Like he, was, he just did some amazing things for the Lord. He eventually gets to the place, church history tells us that Peter was eventually persecuted for sharing the gospel. And he was about to be crucified in Rome. Crucified in Rome. And he said, can I just make one request? One last request. And they said, yeah, what's that? He said, I just, I'm not worthy to be killed the exact same way that my Lord Jesus was killed. Can you hang me upside down when you crucify me? And they said, yeah. And they did. And that's the story of Peter. He went from cowardice to courage all because he got out of the tent. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to follow you. We want to be radical in our faith. We want to change the world for you. But sometimes we forget who we are and the lure to our old lives is pretty strong. So I just asked today, Father, can you remind us of who we are in you? Can I pause in the middle of this prayer and just ask, please, with nobody looking around and with all heads bowed and eyes closed, can I just ask, is there anyone here that you, you lately, you've just been feeling the lure to the old life tent? Can I just see your hand? I wanna pray for you. Thank you. Anyone else? If I can see your hand, yeah. Yeah. You know better. You walked away from it before because it didn't satisfy, but lately there's just been this lure to go back to the old life ten. Thanks, anyone else? Slip up your hand real clearly so I can see. Thank you. Lord, I pray for these who have been feeling this lure. Father, I pray that you will forgive us for longing for the tent that we would never want to live in. Forgive us for, for, uh, for doubting you and for walking away when you don't respond the way we want you to. Lord, help us to walk in step with you and to walk away from that old life tent. Can I also ask this before we close? 
We talked about the big hole in our hearts, the God-sized hole in our hearts that can only be filled with the Spirit of God. Are you here today saying, that's me. I have a hole in my heart, and I know it can only be filled with the Spirit of God. I want that rebirth experience. Can you pray for me, Dave? Can you slip up your hand if that's you today? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Hands going up across this room. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm seeing all the hands. Thank you. Father, I pray for these today that are saying, Lord, fill me with the Spirit. Do something new in me. Lord, your word says that if anyone is, is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things are made new. And Father, I pray that they will feel that, that they are a new creature in Christ. Father, fill us with your spirit. We all have open hearts to you today. Fill us with your love, fill us with your spirit and help us to walk in the knowledge that you love us and you're for us. We ask in Jesus' name.